Okay, let's get started. Um, as I mentioned today, I have a headache and uh, I'm not actually good. <laughs> so I apologize that uh, that uh, compared with the uh, previous lectures, I might be a little bit less energetic about uh, today's course. So first, uh, I would like to uh, talk about fine tuning transfer learning uh, in uh, the speech recognition, especially in the end-to-end -end ASR context. Uh, it can be applied to the classical HM-based approaches, but I kind of most, more focus on the end-to-end -end ASR. And the, uh, this uh, approach is actually quite popular and powerful, uh, especially when we are adapting our speech recognition problems to a new environment. Uh, what kind of environment we can consider? Speech has a lot of variations. So the, uh, the, I could come up with two variations. Uh, one is the language. We build a speech recognition uh, mostly in uh, English, but of course uh, we have a 7,000 languages and they to uh, realize all the kind of speech recognition in the 7,000 languages. Of course, uh, the, most of them are actually very low resource. And then uh, given the kind of uh, the big uh, the model uh, trained with the high resource languages and then adapting to the, uh, the target language is one actually option. The other important uh, adaptation scenarios in speech recognition uh, is noise, environment, uh, recording condition. So uh, this one, I actually explained it with the, uh, several uh, the data augmentation scenarios in the last time. So in our uh, real scenario, we our applications may have a, a lot of uh, the unexpected uh, the, the environmental conditions uh, than uh, that we collected in the data, uh, including the, uh, the noise and room impact response. And the uh, previous approach uh, in the data augmentation, we try to simulate them as many as possible. Uh, that is one option during training. But the other uh, option is that we could correct uh, the small amount of some specific environmental data and then do the, uh, the fine tuning. Uh, that is uh, the, the, our uh, the usual uh, the strategy uh, the in addition to the data augmentation uh, and so on. Uh, we could come up with the other environment, uh, like for example, speaking style, native, non-native, dialect, uh, many of the situations uh, that that's actually uh, make a mismatch between the original training data and the target data. And then that we actually need to have a fine tuning, uh, the transfer learning fine tuning, since uh, these kind of data are generally not easy to collect in the large scale. Okay, uh, then the I prepare the uh, this kind of uh, layers uh, imitating the one of the deep neural network. So uh, generally, what fine tuning is doing is that given we have a uh, model parameters uh, trained from the uh, large scale data, we fine tune uh, all parameters by using the uh, initialized model. Uh, based on the uh, the uh, high resource data, uh, this is actually classically uh, that we are doing. And the uh, my recommendation is anyway adapt all parameters uh, the, without uh, considering some structure. That is the kind of first thing we should do. But the uh, uh, adaptation uh, means that we don't have uh, so many data. So we actually want to kind of restrict the number of parameters to be adapted and then freezing a many of parameters that can be very efficient, right? And this is actually quite true. And that we often should uh, do this kind of ways. 
And the, uh, this is more like a rough, uh, my kind of uh, uh, the, the suggestions uh, the how to kind of fine tune the model. If the adaptation natures are more related to the uh, uh, original acoustics, we should definitely uh, fine tune the lower layers and they may possibly uh, the freeze uh, higher layers. So the example would be that if uh, we do some kind of a noisy speech uh, recognition adaptation, and then most likely uh, the, the lower layers uh, would have a more acoustic information and the higher layer would have more linguistic information. And the lower layers uh, may not uh, be so robust for the acoustic changes so that we should actually fine tune the lower layers uh, in these cases than the higher layers. Uh, so it, the, 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 uh, the suggestion is if uh, we try to make the model to be adapted to the noise environment, we may actually freeze the higher layers and they fine tune the lower layers. And the other approach would be to uh, use the, uh, the uh, tune, fine tune the higher layers and then uh, the keeping the uh, lower layers uh, to be freezed. This uh, the scenario would be uh, the, uh, the good when we uh, try to kind of uh, adapt your model to the language. In this case, uh, the, some higher layers already, uh, some higher layers have a linguistic information and even, for example, the last layer uh, may be, uh, may not be used to the other languages because the script is different, right? Uh, when we train the SR system with English and then apply to the Arabic, we cannot use it because uh, the Arabic uh, the, is uh, the not based on the Latin uh, the English character. So we actually need to even change the last soft max layers. But uh, uh, usually we do not have to train everything, just higher layers we can kind of uh, the fine tune and then lower layers uh, we can keep, uh, that will be fine. And this is actually quite uh, the, the, uh, the, the important investigations. And I see some of your uh, the, the term project, uh, the course project, and some people seem to have some more focus on the front end. Uh, and some people are more focused on the kind of uh, language side. And then the, you guys can also then uh, remind uh, this kind of structure. And if you do some kind of fine tuning, uh, please also uh, follow this kind of guideline. But by the way, always uh, the, before doing some kind of freaky things, uh, you guys can just kind of uh, do the simple st stage, which is uh, the adapting all parameters. This is actually also working quite well. Okay, and then uh, there are several other advanced topics uh, for this adaptation. Uh, the, uh, the, our kind of our, our target uh, is to reduce the number of parameters since the amount of training data is also small. Even the fine tuning uh, is a way to uh, the initialize the, uh, the, the parameters from the uh, good model and then the, the uh, the adapting to the, uh, the target uh, the environment, we still need to consider to uh, train uh, the fine tune, the, the million or 10 millions uh, of parameters. But the adapter network is actually a different concept. We just kind of inserting the very small uh, the, the adapter uh, network uh, between the transformer layers. And then uh, the basically freezing all of this kind of a big uh, the, the models, but only fine tune this kind of adapter network, which is uh, generally uh, the, the having a quite small number of parameters. Uh, the, say, for example, the, uh, the less than a million parameters. So this approach would also be working quite well 
and actually has been studied a lot in the NLP. And recently, speech people also started to use this kind of approaches. And the same approach, a similar approach is prompt. This is actually uh, putting the, uh, the information uh, of the, uh, the prompt, uh, the basically adding the additional feature in addition to the, uh, the our kind of sequential feature, input features. And then uh, the making this part to be learned so that this part is adapting to the uh, new environment and so on. This are the, the prompt based approach and the adapter based approaches are a way to kind of reducing the number of parameters to be very small. And then still we can add uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, use the, uh, the fine tuning technique uh, to uh, the, the make our uh, the model to be uh, uh, changed to the uh, targeted uh, model. So this one may also be quite uh, powerful uh, in uh, the application of the adaptation scenarios. Okay, so, so far I uh, discussed the fine tuning and the transfer learning. In the case that we have our data, we have small amount of the pair data uh, for the target domain. So uh, for example, in the noisy speech recognition cases, we have a small amount, let's say one hour or two hours of the speech, noisy speech and the corresponding transcriptions. And let's say uh, in the uh, multilingual cases, uh, we have a small uh, amount of some other uh, specific other uh, minor resource languages, which has other uh, uh, one hour or 10 hours, uh, the, but it is transcribed. So uh, the many of our kind of application actually assuming that uh, we have a pair data. But uh, uh, the, we could see that this kind of a pair data is generally very difficult to obtain. I think people still remember our first uh, the, uh, weekly assignment, which is transcribing the switchboard data. <laughs> I believe people cannot do it well. <laughs> but uh, don't worry, me neither. <laughs> so uh, we want to, for example, get the spontaneous speech uh, since we uh, want to uh, the improve the performance of the spontaneous speech, right? However, just kind of uh, the annotating the one hour data may take 10 times uh, larger uh, or, uh, or could be more or less depending on the kind of uh, how much the uh, transcribers are matured to this task. But in general, it is very cost uh, that expensive. But we can have actually large audio only and the text only data, right? Um, for example, uh, text only data is quite obvious uh, that we can, you know, use the web data or we can use the uh, news article, we can use the book. Uh, we can actually have a lot of uh, the in domain text data. So uh, the, uh, this uh, the, the access is quite actually uh, the, the common uh, the in our kind of human language technology domain. Same for audio data. Yes, it is very difficult to transcribe, uh, but the, uh, the audio only data are available everywhere, right? So we have a lot of, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the YouTube or other uh, the, the, uh, the audio uh, the data uh, and the, uh, the pod, uh, podcast and so on, uh, broadcast news and so on. So we could actually have a, a lot of uh, the audio only data as well. So uh, the, let's try to use this. Uh, it's the next uh, the, the target. So uh, the original kind of uh, the target uh, was supervised learning, but in the audio only data, uh, we do not have a corresponding transcription data or we do not have a uh, corresponding uh, text on the data. So this 
So uh, let's start about text only data because this is uh, more like uh, intuitive. And also, it is already appeared uh, in some of my prior studies, uh, prior lectures. So uh, the text only data, one straightforward approach is just building language model. Just building a language model. And then there are some kinds of discrepancy, but still it is effective to uh, the use the language model, just simply combining from uh, the, with the end-to-end -end ASR systems. So this approach I already uh, mentioned uh, in the previous uh, lectures. The other approach is actually using TTS. And this approach is quite hot topic now in speech recognition. So this is uh, the, this idea is also simple, uh, but the more straightforward. We only have a text data and we don't have a corresponding audio data. But if we have a TTS model, we can actually generate the pair data, right? So that's it. So this approach uh, is actually uh, quite uh, straightforward. And it's not working. It was not working used to be because the TTS model was not very great. But the recent TTS uh, the, the, uh, uh, research uh, the, is significantly improved. And some of the models actually claims that it's achieving the, uh, the, uh, the performance uh, the close to the human. Uh, the, the, the speech synthesis system. So then the, the, uh, the idea is that uh, we use such a uh, the, uh, the high performance TTS and then uh, generating the, uh, the, the audio data. However, there are a lot of actually problems. Again, you know, uh, TTS is not perfect. TTS actually generating the wrong uh, audio, like similar to ASR, would have uh, the, the wrong uh, the text estimation. Uh, in this case, we're using a data selection. And the people also even uh, the, the using uh, this TTS techniques and then attaching to the ASR model again. And then uh, the, uh, evaluating whether this uh, TTS system can produce the uh, exactly same text uh, by using the ASR system and then checking the consistency. And then even including this kind of a system uh, in the training. So this is a kind of a, a, the current, uh, the, the, the uh, exciting uh, the uh, research topic of uh, how to use TTS. Not just as a kind of independent module, even sometimes integrating ASR and the TTS and try to kind of uh, the, the optimize the entire system. That is quite hot topic now. By the way, uh, one important note I would like to mention in this direction, in, especially in the speech recognition. I mentioned that the uh, TTS, uh, uh, not TTS, the text-only data is available. Large-scale text-only data is available often. So why not we can use it? That is the other, other concept. Uh, of this kind of a direction of the research. However, is it really true? Do we have a large scale text data? Yes. However, all of this web data is actually written text. What we want, especially for uh, recognizing the conversational speech, is spoken text. I still cannot have a, a good resource to cover large scale spoken text. So uh, many people actually said that, you know, well, language model, strong language model can solve our problem. Uh, Half true, but half not. Again, spoken text is very different uh, the, from the, uh, the uh, written text. And it is very difficult to actually uh, scale it. 
uh, so that this actually approach has a little bit discrepancy. <clears throat> However, uh, at least uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, these are uh, the two approaches are uh, quite actively studied again. The reason is because uh, the people are, more, are focusing on the um, out of vocabulary words, which is not included in the pair data. So basically, new words, all of the new words uh, would be uh, considered as uh, out, of, out of vocabulary, and which is sometimes very important for us to recognize. And then in this case, actually, uh, language model fusion or TTS is very effective. So the people are working on this direction, but mostly actually dealing with uh, uh, such kind of out of vocabulary issues. And I don't know so much about, for example, try to use the large scale spoken text to uh, the, the, uh, the help uh, speech recognition. Again, because we don't have such kind of a large scale data. Okay, uh, let's move to the audio uh, only data. And uh, how to use the audio only data? And actually one approach is quite similar to what I mentioned in the TTS. We just have our speech consistent uh, that trained with some paired data. And again, speech condition is also getting matured now. Uh, we don't have so many errors. So actually we use a speech condition system and then uh, the generating the text and then uh, using uh, this uh, pair of the data to train the uh, speech condition system again. And this uh, particular technique is called the pseudo labeling technique because this label uh, may not be the ground truth. Uh, comes from the uh, ASR system. So uh, the, this uh, the, the approach, uh, the pseudo labeling uh, the approach is actually uh, the, has been widely used. Um, this approach uh, is actually uh, the quite uh, the, the, uh, the powerful and the, uh, this approach is actually seen straightforward. It's, I say that it's not an older technique. Uh, it's, it's not a new technique. It is actually quite old technique. And the, even at the very old time in, for example, 1990s, uh, this kind of pseudo labeling technique uh, already exist. However, again, uh, the, uh, recently this approach uh, gained more attention because we have uh, the, the more uh, the accurate uh, ASR systems uh, so that uh, we can actually generate a uh, lot of uh, the, the text data uh, from the, uh, uh, from the um, uh, audio only data. Uh, by the way, uh, this approach is sometimes even improve the, the ASR, uh, even improve the ASR performance by using the ground truth label. Um, one reason is that uh, the often label has some mistakes. So I actually found that uh, this, uh, the pseudo labeling techniques uh, using the, for example, if we have our pair data, we make a model, and then with the pseudo labeling technique for this same data, we don't using actually additional audio only data. And then I found that sometimes pseudo labeling techniques actually further improve the performance because uh, the label has a lot of errors. And then the, the, I found that the, the, the such kind of a very uh, the, the weird errors uh, can be, how to say, uh, removed 
by uh, pseudo labeling techniques uh, because uh, such kind of are uh, the uh, errors. Uh, for, let's say, for example, due to some kind of alignment mismatch, uh, the, the one audio including the three sentences. This all, often happens uh, in the uh, our actual kind of uh, the training data, and this kind of uh, the errors uh, the, is gone uh, by using the pseudo labeling technique. So uh, this uh, the happens a lot uh, in the, uh, the speech recognition. Uh, and also machine translation as well. Machine translation also uh, the often crawl the data instead of purely people to uh, the, uh, the, uh, translate uh, the, uh, the data manually. So the, the, in the machine translation areas, I also observed that the pseudo labeling technique actually uh, got to better performance than the, uh, the, the supervised training uh, in some scenarios. Okay, but this is uh, just for purely compare it with a supervised and uh, other the uh, semi -sup uh, supervised and the pseudo labeling approaches. But the again the um, um, the advantage of using this pseudo labeling technique is that we can actually uh, the incorporating a lot of audio only data, right, and then. Another technique that people often face it on is that if we have a too many audio only data and then using a pseudo labeling techniques, a model can be just kind of a bias to this kind of a, a, the audio only and pseudo labeling uh, data because it has a, a, a can be potentially a very large than the supervised data. And then the, the model is actually uh, the having a uh, once this kind of a uh, uh, the model fails uh, the uh, the training, this kind of a uh, uh, the failing is uh, the, the continued, and then model is actually not converted. So uh, the, to avoid this kind of a issue, we usually actually combine supervised and the semi supervised, a uh, should supervised and should labeling uh, the, the data, and this balance is very important. So we may, for example, uh, the try not to uh, the, uh, the have uh, too many pseudo labeling so that the model uh, the goes to the uh, possibly wrong pseudo labeling techniques by adding uh, the more kind of uh, the, uh, supervised data. Uh, more here means that, of course, we cannot increase the, uh, the supervised data more. So instead, we try to uh, the sample uh, supervised data uh, more and then making it same balance. This kind of balancing is also very important uh, for the pseudo labeling technique. Okay. So now uh, that, that we move to the other approach, this is a self-supervised learning. And this becomes very, very popular. Uh, the, uh, this actually doesn't require the uh, initial pre-trained model. Uh, speech recognition model. This is purely done by training the audio only data. However, the question is how to prepare the training problem only with the audio only data. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, the approaches Probably the most famous one is uh, the web to back 2.0. Uh, and then the uh, second uh, most famous one would be a Hubert. And there are several other uh, approaches, in, including a random projection quantizer and so on. All the tasks, basically, uh, all the model, of course, model architecture is different. Huh? But not only the model architecture is different, they also try to make some task that can be accomplished only with the audio data uh, so that the model learns something. So this uh, model learns something is very important. 
And then the, the let's say for example Hubert case, which is quite uh, the, the, the intuitive. So I want to explain it from the audio only data. How to uh, make a task? So the Hubert, uh, we actually first are uh, converting this waveform to MCC. This uh, data without any supervision, right? And then we just using the single processing knowledge to converting this signal uh, to the feature. Um, this doesn't do anything. Next, we actually do performing k-means of this MCC. So that we try to find some discrete representation uh, from speech. And then after we got the discrete representation, we using this other signal, supervised signal, and then uh, performing some uh, data training task. So, uh, the, basically, we use the mask mask based loss. But anyway, uh, the what we are doing is to predicting this k means ID from this uh, the low audio. So yes. Right. Right. Very good question. This is actually uh, the outside of kind of a training, I would say, just for the data preparation part. It does not have to be differentiable, or even we actually uh, did not, even we can, by the way, make K means to be somehow differentiable. But the, 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 I think uh, it is not easy to make a derivative uh, for uh, the, to, uh, the train entire system by using this. Uh, the, uh, the, deri uh, the derivative in k-means because we don't have uh, any learnable parameters here. So it may not be so important. But anyway, the, the point is that uh, let's try to find some task. And then uh, the, in this case, uh, we're using this kind of very simple task. By the way, this design of the task is, uh, the, 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 can be uh, the various ways. The other approach, random projection quantizer, is actually just uh, the similar to this kind of a uh, the, the figure, but uh, the, even we don't do uh, any uh, the uh, the meaning for k means. We just are uh, converting uh, this feature to very kind of a higher uh, the dimension uh, by using the random projection and then quantize them, and then using it as other other ID. So this other part uh, is called the pretext task. Anyway, given the audio to make a little bit difficult task, and then other asking the network to train this model, uh, basically that's it. This kind of approach somehow first, you know, know the speech. This model knows the speech uh, because it is feeded and also performing some task. And actually k-means of the MSCC feature is not completely nonsense task, right? Because MSCC, as you see from the uh, your kind of uh, coding assignment, uh, to uh, MSCC and the Gaussian mixture is almost like a k-means, I'd say. You could actually perform speech function, right? Uh, this means that the MSCC k-means, this has some kind of other speech function like information. Asking neural network to uh, solve this. So uh, uh, this kind of design uh, is uh, quite 
uh, turned out to be very powerful and scalable to the uh, large amount of data. And uh, another important part is that this is still not super task specific. I say that it is, you know, uh, related to the speech recognition task for sure, because MSCC has a lot of information of actually doing a speech recognition. But since this is a K means, so it is not explicitly solving a speech recognition. So actually, this K mean can also be changed depending on the speakers and so on. So this task is actually not specific to speech recognition, but can be generalized to the other speech processing programs and so on. So this other uh, self supervised learning approach is actually uh, the, 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 uh, found that it is not only for improving the speech function performance, but also uh, performing well on the other task uh, based on this kind of general uh, pretext task. So one example uh, is actually the spark uh, challenge. Uh, this uh, the activity is um, uh, how to say multiple organization activities, uh, including the uh, the researchers here in CMU, and actually me uh, the the two TAs at uh, the Shuangkai and the Zhao Tonda also involved in this project. In this project, we found that not only speech recognition but the all other tasks related to speech processing, it seems like this self-supervised learning is very strong. So based on this concept, we actually extending uh, this uh, the, the, uh, method, not only evaluating its speech recognition, but try to evaluate the general benchmark of the speech processing based on the self-supervised learning. And this initial trial, uh, we actually including the 10 speech processing tasks, including a spoken language understanding, speaker verification, speaker dialogization, emotion recognition, and so on. There are a lot of such kind of direction of the studies. However, uh, there is one difficulty of combining the self-supervised learning of the acoustic features and the language uh, text. Because this one is not natural language. So this one is just a unique, some, uh, this, this one is just an ID. We might providing some information about, you know, 14 can be silence and so on. But in general, we don't know the correspondence of this other uh, should token and the other uh, uh, the uh, actual natural uh, language. So due to that, uh, it is actually not straightforward to combine uh, these kind of uh, the two self supervised uh, learning approaches. However, uh, this is. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. This is a very, very good uh, the, the direction. And actually, our group is also working on how to connecting this uh, the, the, uh, cell supervised learning in the audio side and the text side uh, by uh, the, somehow uh, the, the connecting the, uh, the correspondence of the audio input and the, uh, the text information. Actually, one of the TA, uh, Jalton, uh, the uh, recently uh, proposed the approach, which is actually try to kind of uh, the connecting this to the phoneme, still based on the unsupervised approaches. So the the the, uh, the concept of uh, the uh, the not using the aligned uh, the, the the paired data still exists. And then getting some kind of from here we kind of getting the information about phoneme. And then uh, we use pronunciation dictionary and then connecting the phoneme information to the text. 
And then we could use a large, large uh, the text uh, pre-trained model, or we actually pre uh, the using the pre-trained model uh, based on the phoneme representation. Uh, anyway, uh, by using that, we use some kind of a, a tricky training uh, and the, the uh, resource and so on. But anyway, we can combine uh, the both kind of pre-training. But uh, this is, uh, the, I would say, that's still in the, uh, the investigation stage. Uh, and it can be a very kind of big topic. So I actually prepared the uh, web page for the SPA benchmark. Hope it will be working. Okay, it's working. So this benchmark probably uh, the instead of ex explaining detail, maybe data model is very impressive. So let's check it. So this leaderboard, each row corresponding to the uh, self-supervised learning models. QBAT is here. Web 2 back 2 is here. Data 2 back is here. Uh, WebRAM is here. And WebRAM, uh, the, the proposal of Microsoft, is currently the best performance in this benchmark. Um, what is the best? We try to kind of evaluate the generalization of this kind of self-supervised learning model. And this, uh, the law is very interesting. Uh, uh, the column information is very interesting. Uh, basically, this, uh, the scores are kind of combining all scores. But basically, this column corresponding to the speech recognition, uh, sorry, speech processing task each of the speech processing tasks. Phoneme recognition, intention classification, speech recognition, uh, emotion recognition, uh, the, and so on. And then the, we actually ranking uh, uh, this kind of system, not just because of only checking the ASR performance, but checking all entire other systems. But surprisingly, uh, all of these kind of, most of these kind of top methods are way better than classical MSCC in all tasks. Actually, filter bank MSCC is here. And all tasks are actually are way better than uh, the filter bank. And also some of the model, like for example, uh, originally uh, the, in this kind of approaches, APC, uh, the web to back uh, is kind of a, a the classical techniques. And web to back to Hubert is not only better than the single uh, task like ASR, but all the kind of tasks Actually, uh, this method is outperforming the uh, prior self-supervised model. So this is, uh, the, for me, quite amazing. One model can be used for many of our speech applications. So I think some of your uh, the, the projects uh, also related to self-supervised learning. And uh, if you guys are using ESPNet, actually we can easily switch to uh, Hubert or WebRM by just changing the one of the configuration part. Uh, and the WebRM based approach is quite powerful actually now. Okay, let's uh, go back to the discussion. Okay, so uh, these are uh, the summary of the uh, advanced end-to-end -end ASR technique. And uh, uh, including the previous method, uh, previously uh, the introduced method, like a data augmentation, 
uh, same supervised, uh, self-supervised approach. Uh, the end-to-end -end SR has been actually uh, the, uh, the quite uh, the, the significantly improved and still improved uh, better and better. And the final uh, the, the across approach uh, and the uh, some of the kind of uh, the example in the data uh, preparation is quite uh, the, the interesting direction. So we could basically easily uh, the combine our task to the other speech processing task. Like for example, in the data preparation cases, mm -hmm. I explained the multilingual speech recognition or code switching, or even uh, the, the including language identification and so on. Uh, spoken language understanding and so on. As an example, just changing the data preparation, uh, we can flexibly change speech recognition task to such kind of various application. This is very cool. And then uh, the, the fine tuning, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the pre-training fine tuning can actually even improve the performance for some specific task. And the other application is that the self-supervised learning can actually improve the uh, many of speech processing tasks again. So uh, these advanced end-to-end -end SR techniques are not only purely improving the speech recognition, but we can actually have a lot of applications. Uh, we can extend a lot of applications uh, thanks to this kind of a, a flexible framework of speech recognition at, at, at the neural networks and recent uh, advances in the, uh, the self-supervised learning model. Okay, so this is the semi-supervised training part. And uh, I will go through the, uh, the search part and the post-processing part in the rest uh, 21 minutes. It's a little bit challenging, <laughs> but let me try. So, um, we mostly focused on the training and the um, uh, model architecture, and we didn't have uh, so much discussions about the uh, search. Uh, search is actually, of course, most uh, one of the most another important part of getting from to probability distribution. Uh, from this probability distribution to getting the most probable for the uh, token sequence. And then this uh, the means that we can get the speech function result uh, from this probability. We again, we mostly focus on how to obtain this one during the training phase or as a neural network architecture. But another important part is uh, this part, how to get argmax. And this part is actually quite annoying because it's easy uh, that uh, goes to the quite large number. So this is one example. Let's say that token vocabulary size after the BPE, it can be 5,000. And it, the length of the token is 20. And then the number of all possible sequence is this number. It is in, impossible. So basically, such problem uh, the, has to deal with this kind of a super huge uh, search space. Okay, so uh, the, it's a little bit too large to you know write five thousand uh, the, the vocabulary and the twenty length. So I will try to use this figure. This is, I believe, probably enough to uh, the, represent our kind of uh, the, the example of the search space. I prepared A, B, C, only three as a kind of a uh, vocabulary. So vocabulary size is three. And then the, the, uh, the, we kind of using the three token sequence. So in this, uh, the simple example, we actually already have a 27 possible sequences. Of course, if we have a more longer, we will have more. And if we have a larger vocabulary size, uh, we will have more. 
So uh, this uh, is uh, the, what we have to solve. And of course, it is not tractable. The next approach is greedy search. This approach, we actually get the best recording result in every time stamp. So first of all, example, uh, the, we started from here. The question is, uh, the, which one is the, uh, the most probable? And let's say uh, this uh, the A is the uh, most probable uh, the, the pass. We can select this one. And then important part, we actually uh, the disregard the rest of two uh, hypotheses. Moving to the next stage, we do the same things. We compute the all possible kind of uh, passes, but in this case, it's only three passes because uh, the previous pass is only taken one. And then uh, the, suppose this second pass is the best in terms of the score, we can only select this one and moving to the next one. By doing that, we actually do not have to consider 27 other the possible sequence. This can actually uh, the achieving uh, by using a very small uh, number of computations. Even we have uh, the, this kind of, uh, the, the, um, if, even uh, the, we have a very long sequence or a very large vocabulary size, uh, it would not be uh, the, uh, the, uh, going to be uh, the exponential. Just the computation is linearly uh, increased, but only linear. So this approach is the uh, most, how to say, uh, the uh, one of the uh, the biggest approximation. Uh, the uh, I would say uh, in the instead of doing the full search. But of course, this is not very powerful, right? Especially. If we made some mistakes, for example, possibly this part can be later growing to be better performance in terms of the full score. Since we make an early decision, we actually cannot recover it. All the possible C and B uh, the, the, uh, the sequences uh, will be gone. So this is the kind of uh, the nature of the greedy search. But still, this is very uh, the, uh, the fast. So this greedy search is often used, uh, especially for CTC. CTC is actually a special case that this uh, greedy search is actually completely fine. Uh, because it doesn't have a label dependency. So it actually doesn't uh, depend on the previous result so that we can actually perform in the greedy recording, uh, but it uh, turns out to be the best uh, the, the sequence result uh, based on the, uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the conditional independence assumption. However, the other models are not the other models are not working in general based on this other greedy search. So for example, attention-based SR or RN transducer, since they have a condition, we actually have to consider the other uh, technique. And then they uh, try to do something between greedy search actually always decide one best in each timestamp so that we cannot recover uh, from the other uh, uh, previous decisions. So instead, why we keep a couple of hypotheses in each timestamp? And then later, we try to kind of evaluate uh, all possible uh, the, the sequence given this kind of limitation and then select the best one. 
this is a kind of a beam search. So basically, a beam search in this other example, we actually consider the two as a beam. So instead of making uh, the decision of only selecting one hypothesis, we keep uh, the two hypotheses in each step. Here, we keep this A and B. And the next, we actually evaluating all possible, uh, the, uh, all possible uh, the, the sequence, subsequence. And then turns out that these two sequence is higher probability, and then we can keep it. And then doing the next stage, and then finding the kind of our best uh, the, the uh, sequence among these uh, the two sequences. And compared with the greedy search algorithm, this one is greedy search. Beam search, we keep some of the hypotheses. And uh, again, if there is some other uh, wrong decision happened here, greedy search cannot recover. But beam search could possibly recover uh, this kind of wrong decision. And if uh, we use a very large beam, of course, uh, we can uh, the possibly avoid uh, this kind of uh, errors uh, further. So I just kind of uh, adding some other equations, but basically uh, the, what we need is that we first need to evaluate the score. In our cases, mostly the, uh, the probability. We first evaluating this kind of a score and then other, other sort them. And then we get the top N. This N becomes a beam size. Going to the next stage, uh, we actually uh, the, the given this kind of a prior uh, the, the, uh, the beam result, we actually expand the hypothesis and then computing all scores and then add a sort it. And then we can get, just get the top end. Again, this end becomes a beam. And basically we computing this incrementally for each time step. So the computation cost is more or less uh, the number of uh, beams uh, the, so that uh, that we can actually avoid to have our uh, exponential computation. So this is actually the, uh, the basic of the beam search. And then the, the, we also need to consider uh, how to uh, the, the specify the, this score function. But anyway, uh, based on this kind of a basic of the beam search, that always kind of are each of the step, we only are the keeping the n hypothesis, okay? So that it's actually cannot increase the computational cost if the a number of uh, the, uh, the step uh, grows uh, in general. And then the, uh, the, let's uh, discuss about the, the, uh, the score function. So score in the uh, speech function cases, of course, it is obvious that we should use the uh, the, the a probability, a conditional uh, log likelihood. The reason we put the log is to actually avoid the, the underflow or overflow. This is very important. And also, um, beam start itself always a number of hypotheses is two or n. However, it's also depend on the how to compute this one. If this calculation is, uh, for example, uh, requires uh, the, the more computation cost, then the, the uh, beam search, uh, the, the, even beam search itself making the computation cost to be the, uh, the uh, number of beam uh, and the, uh, the number of step. Uh, like for example, uh, this one means that we all, always have to compute the 
log likelihood from 1 to j. So if uh, we kind of are making this to be longer, in addition to have a, our kind of a whole loop of j, uh, we also have to compute 1 to j every time. And then this actually computation is, becomes very large. So instead, uh, that we try to always find some uh, the approximation of computation of previously computed uh, score and the current score. And then uh, the, instead of uh, the computing this one every time, if we keep this kind of uh, the computation value, and then every time we just have uh, this kind of computation, this is actually not depending on the length of J. It's uh, the conditioned on the J minus one, but this part is actually computed uh, without uh, the considering the entire J. So this means that, uh, that we can save the computation cost if we using this kind of incremental form. And everyone, please remember, attention-based ASR or RN transducer actually is based on this incremental form, right? So thanks to this form, thanks to this factorization form, we actually can compute this one uh, efficiently. The other model is, by the way, very difficult. Uh, for example, let's say uh, that if we using the, uh, the other model, which is not easy to factorize, like for example, bidirectional language model, which is not easy to factorize. And then the, the, we actually cannot have this kind of a form. And then we cannot compute it efficiently. So uh, the beam search score is actually limited the case that we have this kind of a, a recursive a computational uh, the, uh, form. But the, if we satisfy this condition, we could actually choose a lot of information. Like for example, a language model score, a penalty term, attention and the CTC can also be combined. Attention RN transducer can also be combined. CTC RN transducer can also be combined. This other uh, part of score does not have to be a single other uh, function. Uh, generally, in a kind of a, a, a practical problem, we actually combine a various score uh, satisfying this kind of a, a relationship. And we also have uh, two other uh, such uh, uh, direction. One is output synchronous, which is having actually uh, the J as a for loop timestamp. Uh, that output the token, but the, the RN process and the CTC can actually working on this beam search based on the input uh, the frame. This is called the input synchronous. And the both kind of uh, uh, the, the, the beam search method actually has pros and the cons. Okay, uh, that's it for the summary of the search. Um, search is actually try to find the, uh, the uh, efficient uh, um, uh, candidate uh, by using the approximation. And as you see, a lot of approximation happens and a lot of heuristics happens. One of them is beam search. And the other is that, for example, if we combine the score, we always have to have some other weight parameters. And there are several other heuristics to make the beam search to be working. So compared with the other part of the, uh, the training uh, and so on, beam search actually uh, requires a lot of other the, the techniques, information, efficiency, uh, and so on. And the, that's the kind of end of today's uh, the lecture. And the, I will skip the post-processing. Yeah. And the... Last comment is that uh, enjoy the holidays. <laughs> <laughs>